And these are the managers that the model just thinks are average. They concede the, as many goals as expected goals, and they scored as many as they produced here in bottom right. The XG of the chances that they produce and decrease the XG of the chances that they concede. And overall, the best manager is, is Lucien Favre. And this is something that has been known in the, in the uh, stats community for a while. Hi, and welcome everybody. Um, I'm obviously doing an analysis here on Borussia Dortmund and Lucien Favre. And at the moment, we're looking at his expected goals. You can see here, I'm showing examples from the last couple of seasons at Dortmund. Their expected goals on the right versus the goals that they actually did score on the left. And you can see in all these examples, even going back a third season to Nice, and we can go back to Gladbach, Munch and Gladbach is time there. The goals that he scored and conceded is usually a massive improvement on what they expect a goal should be. So we're going to try and break down through this in a two-part series how he goes about doing it, what are the sort of key themes, what are the secrets behind some of the success he has. So stay tuned and we're going to cover it. Starting off right now with the build-up play, and in particular, a strong focus down this left-hand side. Thomas Tuchel did a lot of this of rotating with a back five to overload a particular side. And you can see here some of the just fundamentals of sliding everyone across this left-hand side it opens up and allows for great potential for overloads in different ways. So as an example, overloading the left half space. Nothing new about this. Lots of teams that are elite do this. But it's the quality that it's done with, the flexibility within a game to adapt and change, as well as the quality of the individuals pulling off these rotations. first clip is the occupation of this left and half space. The central midfielder, the number 10, Julian Brandt, and you'll see Haaland just there in frame. As I mentioned, nothing particularly new about overloading a half space. A key principle within this is that they cannot occupy the same line within that lane. If we operate on a five-lane model, you can see they're always alternating between the different lines of the lane. One of the key principles of always seeking to get in behind the back line. Stretch the back line to create space. A striker that's also willing to go beyond. These will become key features more so as we progress through the presentation. It will be common knowledge to Schalke that Dortmund want to exploit these half space lanes. And so you can see an example here where they're defending this area here. They're opening passing lanes that are obvious to Dortmund, perhaps play out wide. They're leaving those ones open in the hope that they'll choose to take them as opposed to taking the more riskier one. So you can see right now, I would argue that Schalke have got this lane locked down here and, and Dortmund will have to adjust. So rotation is one. So you see wonderful movement there to create space and an overload from Sancho coming in as a second 10 to exploit. But there's only so many times these different rotations are going to work. They need to have variety. So you can see now, there's no one occupying this half space. You can see Brandt's positioning has changed to link up on more central areas, or now to change the focus to the right and half space. Getting in behind the back line is the key skill of Lucien Fevre's ability to coach. So you can see the overload and the getting the players in between the line, but it's the ability to coach the players, their positioning, that entices defenders into bad presses where they arrive fractions late and allow for little openings. Now, it doesn't come off on this occasion, but we're going to see plenty of examples where it does come off. It's become very apparent over the last few years that counter-attacking is the, one of the main coaching qualities that Lucien Favre has. So from his time spent with Nice, Borussia Mönchengladbach, he has really excelled those teams and now is doing so likewise with Dortmund. But it's the kind of player that he's looking for to help achieve these goals. Counter-attacking transitional players, key dribbles 9-10 to 10 a game. Progressive runs for a game. Players that are dynamic, fast, and take the ball a lot of yards and in towards the box. Look at those touches in the penalty box. Five a game. So players that go in the box. You'll see again here the kind of players that play through passes and pass into the penalty box a high percentage of the time for sort of wide players. Not players necessarily that can cross or do lots of crosses. So it's a specific type of player. And you can see the energy, the dynamism, okay, the intensity. Even of nine here, Haaland, exactly the same. Look at where he's counter-attacking down the sides, where he can get in behind. The wing-backs getting on the wrong side because they're faster, stronger. 
And this is what allows them to get beyond the back line into the penalty area more and create moments like this where it doesn't come off. But look at the amount of players in front of Haaland there if he had been able to get a shot off. In terms of reviewing this week's game against Schalke, defensively, Schalke really don't help themselves. This is really poor counter-pressing structures from behind the line of the ball. Pressing. From a dormant perspective, they're perfectly lined up. But look at the speed, the energy, the intensity. And with all these chances, I want you to look at how many bodies are between the ball and the goal. So here in this example, they're pressing high with strong intensity. When they win it back. Okay, here they don't prioritise the correct passing lane. They're prioritising the wider areas, leaving the more central half space lane open. Where again, players are drawn out. Clever movement to get in behind. Players taken out, driving into the box to pass. And look again, if he'd have been able to get on this ball, how many bodies would have been between the ball and the goal upon striking? See another example here. Combination play, drawing players into bad presses into half space, the ability to link and get in behind. And once again, how many bodies are between this player and the goal? Arguably one. Greater pace, greater desire and determination. Drive into the penalty area if you can. How many bodies are in front? One. It's enough on that occasion. So when evaluating why Lucien Favre's teams tend to overachieve on the goals they score versus expected goals, there's three or four things that sort of seem to crop up here. One is, is clearly their ability to outplay through half spaces, draw defenders out, thus getting in behind. You've got the quality of the individuals because they're playing at a high level. You've got the type of player, the fast, dynamic, drive into the box, through balls, passes into the box, etc. Then we have the positioning of our counter-attacking players for that transition who position themselves in a way that they can receive and get at the back line they can become face up but then you've got the counter attack inside of drawing the opposition out to create space to get in behind they don't always play in a high block they often play in a central block but what you get as the end product is low numbers the ball and the goal this is it combined the movement in the half space the ability to get in behind the fast dynamic players the ability to finish and quality and no bodies between the ball and goal so let me ask you a question how many times have you seen your own teams where players take shots from locations that are poor from too far out with lots of bodies between like the edge of the box where there's at least four or five bodies so think about that and then look at the chances and goals that dormants are about to create So again, you can see the two players between the lines, the ability to counter-attack at incredible speed. And when it comes to the finish, it's a great finish, high quality, but there's still not many bodies between there. And you can see here the finesse, ability to outplay the back line, get in behind the back line, pass into the penalty box. And look again, no bodies between on those occasions. And that's the real quality of why Dortmund, from a scoring perspective, overachieve on goals for versus what they should do part two i will be looking into the defending side because there's some unique parts of the strategy there where i'll be looking at how bruce Dorman obtained pitch control how they counter press how they defend key space deny positive actions between the lines play with fantastic intensity and desire they win over 60 percent of their defensive duels and ultimately, it doesn't really matter how good your tactics are, unless you're capable of running through brick walls and winning those battles all over the football pitch, you're never really going to reach the heights in all phases of the game. Finally, let me just say thank you very much for watching. Um, generate discussion in the comments below. I nearly always respond and reply. Um, also, if you have any ideas for any future videos, again, please leave feedback. Don't forget to subscribe, smash a like, share it, because it costs you absolutely nothing. And hopefully I'll see you back for part two. Take care.